Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure today to welcome Professor Catherine Hayhoe to the Summer Stars Lecture Series of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. I am Maureen Ramo, the Interim Director of Lamont, and Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist who studies climate change. Catherine began her career uh, with a BS in physics and astronomy from the University of Toronto publishing papers in the field of observational astronomy on variable stars, galaxy, and galaxy clustering around quasars. As she was finishing her degree, she took a class in climate science, a class that shocked her and changed her life, in her words. She realized that climate science was based on the exact same basic physics, thermodynamics, nonlinear fluid dynamics, and radiative transfer, as she had been learning in astrophysics. So skipping ahead many, many years and after, you know, dozens, over, over 100 authored peer-reviewed research papers and in numerous reports on climate change at the highest national and international levels, Catherine Hayhoe has evolved to become one of the most influential and widely known science communicators of our age. She has probably touched the lives of more citizens on the subject of climate change than any other person I know. I will forego a recitation of her many scientific honors and highlight just a few of the honors she has re received for what we might mundanely call outreach in our proposals. Catherine has been honored as Oxfam America's Sister of the Planet and currently chairs the Earth Science Women's Network Advisory Council. Together with her local PBS station, she writes and produces a digital series called Global Warm global weirding climate politics and religion that runs from october to march every year you can subscribe on youtube and get each episode delivered right to your inbox and it's an incredible teaching tool she was awarded the agu's climate communications prize and named one of time magazine's 100 most influential people and foreign policy magazine's 100 leading global thinkers in 2017, she was named one of Fortune Magazine's World's Greatest Leaders, as well as Working Mothers Magazine, 50 Most Influential Moms. I like that one. In 2019, she was named a United Nations Champion of the Earth. And boy, don't we need more of those in the world. As you might surmise, Catherine Hayhoe is also a grand wizard of social media, and you should definitely follow her on all the usual channels. She has a TED Talk with over 3 million views, which will be different from her talk here because as she told me, hey, why would I give the same talk you can see online? Finally, I would like to end with a lovely quote that I lifted from her website bio. Quote, what means the most to me personally though, is when just one person tells me sincerely that they had never cared about climate change before or even thought it was real, but now because of something they heard me say, they've changed their mind. That's what makes it all worthwhile." Unquote. So with that, Catherine, I would like to welcome you to Lamont, if only virtually. We may all believe in the reality of climate change here, but we certainly can learn how to better talk about it from you. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to be with you here today. And I wanna start off by asking you a couple of questions. Normally we, we do these types of things in person. Now we're all virtual and we're all in different places. So I'm gonna start off here sharing my screen with you. And I'm gonna ask you, where are you joining us from today? So if you look in the chat box, there's actually a link to pollev.com slash my name. So P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash Catherine. The link is in the chat if you just want to click on it. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to take you to this map and it's going to ask you where you are. Now, if you are not in North America, just kind of click off in the direction that you're listening from. Because um, the last time I used this map, we actually had somebody from Nigeria. So we had a dot kind of over there. Um, if, if we do see you in a dot, we'll assume that you are either on a research ship, which you could potentially be given this audience, 
or you are coming from the other side of the ocean in that direction. All right, it looks like we do have a pretty high concentration in New York, uh, but we've got a few on the West Coast. Uh, we've got uh, one off the coast of Nova Scotia. Um, oh, we got somebody from Alberta listening too. Okay, excellent. All right, so now you know how this works. Now, question number two. I want to know a little bit more about you. Question number two, who are you? Are you a student? Are you a researcher or faculty member? Are you another, another type of academic? Are you listening because you're just interested, which is totally fine. All right, it looks like we've got faculty are about 50%. Students are catching up, holding, doesn't this sort of feel like an election? <laughs> it's too early to call, the students could still be, no, I don't think they are, okay. <laughs> It looks, it looks like we're pretty set. All right, so half researchers or faculty, quarter students, and then the rest is split between other academics and just interested. All right, now we're on to the hardest question. And this question you have to answer with a word. The next question is this. Describe what you do in one word. If you have to cheat and use two words, I will let you do that, but you have to put a dot between your words. And you'll see why, because it's a wordle. So if you have to use two words, put a dot between them, but otherwise just use one. Okay, you're getting the hang of it. All right, we've got a couple of people who communicate. So the bigger the word, the more people said that word. You can say any word you want, but oh, research is starting to outweigh it. I'm not surprised at all. So research, learn, communicate. I like that. We've got some specifics like paleoclimate, paleoceanography, climate, carbon. We've got people who organize, people who advocate, people who are activists. Good. We've got people who educate and who analyze, who facilitate, who do design and accounting and crunch data. Yep. Horticulturists, I like that. People who fundraise, very important. People who study different parts of the climate system. All right, I love this. Okay, so no worries. I will copy this and I will put that on Twitter if you want it. We are also recording this, so it will be part of the presentation as well. But I love hearing from you and hearing who you are and what you do. All right, so now you know how this works. And this is how we're gonna be collecting questions at the end also. So I know people often like to type questions in the box on Zoom, but we're not gonna be going there for questions. We're gonna be going to pollev.com slash Catherine at the end for questions as well. So if you have any questions, save it till we get to the end and then you can type in your full question there. And we have lots of time left for discussion. But today we're talking about science in a fat-free world. And we are seeing this today in spades. It is not only about climate change. As early as March, and again, we're in September now, as early as March, reporters started to keep running lists of the latest false information or hoaxes spreading about coronavirus. How big of a problem is fake news in the era of coronavirus? This is an interesting article that I think draws some good parallels. It says, as in every other crisis situation, the main issue isn't that people just gullibly accept whatever they're told. It's that people fail to absorb recommendations from experts again and again and again. Why? Some mistrust towards politicians is understandable. People believe the, mis the information is mistaken or even manipulative. And the parallel that he draws here is not only to um, coronavirus, and it's not only to climate change, it's even whether or not to evacuate from a hurricane that you can see coming on the radar. What experts are saying is something that social scientists call elite cues. So elite cues means what thought leaders are saying. And this is very relevant to our opinions about climate change. This is a study that was published by Carmichael and really um, a number of years ago now, five years ago. And they found that the thought leaders' opinions, that's what elite cues are, thought leaders' opinions, and advocacy efforts, and weather and structural economic factors, they all do influence public concern about climate change. But... Promulgation of scientific information had no observable effect on public levels of concern about climate change from 2001 to 2013. This is a really hard thing for me to see personally as, as 
uh, an author of the National Climate Assessment, as some of you are as well. Information-based science advocacy had only a minor effect. Political mobilization by elites, thought leaders, politicians, pundits, media figures, influencers, that dreaded word, and advocacy groups is critical in influencing levels of climate change concern. So what are influencers, what are elites telling people about climate change? Well, for years, we have had politicians saying things like, for everyone who thinks it's warming, I can find somebody who says it isn't. Not among the scientific community, he can't. Or alarmist theories on climate science originate with scientists who operate outside the principles of the scientific method Whereas in fact, as scientists, we know that if anything, our tendency is to underestimate the rate and the magnitude of projected change rather than the opposite. So we think to ourselves, and this is one of our global weirding episodes, we think to ourselves, if they just knew the facts delivered in a wheelbarrow, surely they change their minds, right? Well, we have the facts. If you do a Google search for climate change, you come up with 2.6 million results. We are now on IPCC assessment number six, and every assessment gets bigger and thicker and heavier than the assessment before. We have national climate assessments, one, two, three, and then national climate assessment number four was so big it got split into two different volumes. Volume one was over 500 pages itself. Volume two was over 1,600 pages, and of course now, um, NCA5 is currently being planned. You're getting the picture here, right? We scientists have signed letters. This letter was signed by 11,000 of us last year, stating that there was a climate emergency. And it isn't just sheer numbers. We've been doing this for a really long time. Not just decades, but centuries. You're probably familiar with the history of climate science. If you're not, there's a great book by uh, Spencer Weert called The History of Global Warming. We also have a short global weirding episode, if you just have five minutes, that goes through all of these characters and talks about how Fourier was the first person to actually identify the greenhouse effect, how Tyndale specifically identified which gases contributed to it and linked them to coal mining, how Eunice Foote, of course, who's a scientist that we've just started to learn about in recent years, Eunice Foote conducted an experiment where she measured the heat trapping properties of carbon dioxide. Her experiment was not perfect because she didn't distinguish between um, infrared and visible light, but um, she has been highlighted in an obituary that was recently written for her in the New York Times just this past year. And here's something really interesting, just taking a little deviation here because I love learning more about Eunice and I figure you might too. Um, uh, Joe, Joe Ortiz and Roland Jackson actually reanalyzed Eunice's uh, data that she collected and she published in a paper that was submitted to the AAAS's annual meeting in 1856. She did not read that paper herself. It was read by the head of the Smithsonian on her behalf, but the very next year she read a second paper of her own in person at the AAAS meeting in uh, 1857. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, Joe and Roland reanalyzed Eunice's data, and they found that from her data, you could calculate a climate sensitivity value of about three degrees Celsius. Isn't that amazing? So you can look up uh, their paper in the Annals of the Royal Society if you're interested afterwards. But the point is, is that we have known about this for a very long time. And we communicate about this in many different ways. I just checked today and the list of scientists who do climate on Twitter is up to 1,000, or sorry, 3,109 members. We have uh, over 10,000 people who subscribed. If you are a scientist and you're on Twitter and you're not on this list, uh, ping me on Twitter. Make sure that your expertise and your position or your affiliation is in your bio and I would love to add you. If you don't know if you're on a list, just go to your profile, click on lists and it will tell you what list you're on. And we are always telling people things that apparently they need to know, like what? Well, the last two days, apparently people needed to know that 
wildfires don't just stop at the U.S. border. What stops at the U.S. border is U.S. data. But that doesn't mean there aren't wildfires in Canada. So apparently some people took the maps of wildfires in the U.S. and took that to mean there was no wildfires in Canada. Therefore, by some incredible leap of the imagination, that meant that climate change wasn't real. I'm not quite sure of the logic and nobody has really explained it to me, but I'm guessing it's something like if they're only in the U.S., they were lit by climate change activists specifically to try to prove that climate change is real in order to force the election. But in Canada, we're not having an election, so people aren't doing that. Maybe. I'm not sure. If you have a better explanation, let me know. So unfortunately, this was so pro prevalent that I had to tweet about it. Uh, Marshall Shepard, who many of you might know, had to write a Forbes article about it. Wildfires don't stop at the Canadian border. And so on it goes and it goes. So we think if everybody just knew all of this, if they just knew how many scientists there are, how long we studied this, how many IPCC reports there are, how many facts we have, surely they change their minds, right? Not really. And here's why. It has very little to do with the physical science and that has everything to do with the social science, psychological science, and even our physiological science. But let's start with this. We live in a world that is now much more politically polarized than it was just 25 years ago. So back in 1994, when uh, the Pew Foundation started to track political polarization in the US, this is what it looked like. We had two pretty normal distributions. So in other words, most people were in the middle of the distribution. The median Democrat and the median Republican were closer to each other than they were to people at the opposite ends of their own spectrum. Then what happened? Over time, we've moved apart. And when in 2017, the last federal election, they surveyed only people who voted and guess what they found? Yes, we have become so politically polarized that both the median Democrat and the median Republican are now closer to the tails or the fringes of their own party than they are to the middle. Doesn't that explain a few things? Yes. What does this have to do with climate change? Pretty much everything. Because it turns out that the most politically polarized issue in the whole United States since the Obama administration has consistently been climate change. What you're looking at here is you're looking at the results of a Pew Research Center poll that asked people how they prioritize different issues. And the red is the Republicans, the blue is the Democrats, and the gray bar in between them shows how different they are. So the bigger the gray bar, the more polarized people are on that topic. This, was, this poll was done in January. It was released in February. And you might say, well, yeah, but surely things have changed, right? They have changed, yes, but here's what they look like as of August. Now, this is not ordered in order of the, the, the widest gray bar, but I'll show you what the top three is, are. So the number three most polarized issue is now coronavirus, yes. The number two most polarized issue is race and ethnic inequality. And what's the number one most polarized issue? It is still climate change, yes. It is not just in the US. I'm from Canada. We had an election a year ago last fall. Every political party, except for the People's Party of Canada, which is a science denying party, every other party had a climate plan, but the Conservatives' climate plan would actually increase carbon emissions. That was their climate plan. In the UK, Tory members of parliament are five times as likely to vote against climate action as Labour MPs. In Brazil, used to be a global leader on climate change. Now they're burning down the Amazon. And of course, in Australia, they had a carbon tax and they got rid of it. And when the wildfires in Australia were burning in January, the exact same disinformation was circling the internet and is circling the internet today. The exact same. It's all arson. Some of those fires were even lit by climate activists, so the disinformation went, and climate change has nothing to do with it. When I see stuff on Twitter, and this is just a random sample, I get a few, a handful of these every day. When I see things on Twitter like, 
no thanks to the leftist crap teaching of some loony socialist professor or the fact that I'm a danger to society or I'm a propagandist. Before I block these people, I go to their profiles and what do you think I see? No matter whether they're from the US, Canada, Australia or the UK, what I see is always the same. Conservative politics. These are their bios that they write themselves. It is all about conservative politics. It's not about the science. So I've been doing a lot of reading lately and one of the best books I've read recently um, during the quarantine was a book called The Influential Mind by a neuroscientist called Tally Sherratt. And among many things she says in this book, she says, our brains are actually programmed to get a kick out of information. We like information. We've evolved to appreciate and value information for obvious reasons. But when we give people new information, they typically only accept it if they already believe it. If it contradicts what they believe, their brain shuts off. So people don't really have a problem with the actual science. They have a problem with the fact that it seems to contradict what they believe. And she goes on to say, the wealth of information in today's information era makes us more resistant to change because it's easy to find data that supports our pre-existing opinion. And this is the kicker, even worse, I wrote the even worse, even worse, the more we are exposed to contradicting information and opinions, the more polarization expands over time. So in other words, continuing to hit people upside the head with more and more bad news about climate change can actually be more polarizing, not less. It actually is part of a vicious cycle. Climate changes, we get worried. Who wouldn't be worried looking at what's happening to our planet? So we think if people just knew what we know, if they knew all the scary things that we know, surely they would understand how we need to act. But what neuroscience shows is that when people are overwhelmed with especially scary or fearful data that contradicts what they already believed, people reject it even more. And the result is not action. The result is inaction. As Tally says, fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw or to freeze or to give up rather than taking action. So then we might say, well, maybe it's just a case of education. People don't know enough science, so maybe we just need to educate them in basic science. Well, the social scientists have looked at that too. This is Dan Cahan from Yale. And back in 2012, he published a study in Nature looking at whether the knowledge deficit model was accurate. In other words, do people really not understand enough science? And if they did, would they change their mind about climate change? No. He found that members of the public with the highest degree of science literacy are not most concerned about climate change. Rather, they are most what? Most polarized. People do not really have a problem with lack of education, with lack of knowledge, and lack of intelligence. In fact, Dan went on in subsequent work to design a metric that he called ordinary science intelligence. It's a measure of how able people are, how capable they are of processing um, data and scientific uh, findings and probabilities and things like that. And then he asked people, is there solid evidence of recent global warming due mostly to human activity like burning fossil fuels? And he found a very weak correlation between ordinary science intelligence and the probability of the correct response. In other words, going from the low, lowest 10 percentile to the upper 90th percentile, you would go from about a 40% chance of a correct response, maybe, I don't know, maybe 38, 38 to 40% chance of a correct response, up to about a 60% chance of a correct response. So that's not a big difference. But then... He took this data set and he divided it into two pieces based on what do you think? Not level of education, not gender, not age, political affiliation. And what he found is that the smarter we are, you know what we use our intelligence for? We use it to go out and cherry pick information that shows that we're right. And you know what? We all do this. 
We all do it. We all look for things to confirm what we already believe. It's called confirmation bias. Let me give you a pretty low stakes example. So my husband and I are both academics. Some of you may also be married to or partnered with an academic. And when we argue about things, we tend to go out and find peer reviewed literature that supports our position. But when I go out to find that, that literature, I'm not going out to find literature that shows that he's right. I'm going out to find literature that shows that I'm right. Like for example, can you eat yogurt past the due date? I'm not joking. We actually looked up peer reviewed studies on that and guess what? We found studies that said both things. So we had to agree that I eat the yogurt and he doesn't. But the point is, is that the smarter we are, it doesn't mean we necessarily agree with the science. It means we're better able to justify or rationalize the pre-existing opinion we already have if that pre-existing opinion is very closely tied to our identity. So what Dan and his colleagues concluded was, translating this into English, being smarter doesn't make us more accepting of science. It just makes us better able to cherry pick what we need to validate what we already believe. In other words, the smarter we are, the more inclined we are to believe that we can out argue the devil. So then you might say, okay, well, if it's, if it's not lack of information about science and it's, if it's not intelligence or education, I know what the real problem is. And I didn't wanna bring this up to you, Catherine, because I thought you might be offended if I said this, but I know the real problem really is religion. Well, don't worry, I'm not offended by that at all. I hear it quite a bit. And I've looked at it myself because I wanna know, is this the real problem? Here's what we find. Now, first of all, first of all, we certainly have the impression that it could be the real problem. But one, another book that I was reading since the quarantine started is this really interesting book basically on the history of politics in the United States. And as a non-US citizen who's never taken US history, um, I learned quite a bit about the evolution of politics and religion. And what was absolutely fascinating to learn, for example, with the kind of the epitome of the science faith um, conflict, which is evolution and origins. It was fascinating to learn that the first US scientist to review and publicly support Darwin work was a devout Christian, that theistic evolution was taught in conservative seminaries from the time of Darwin until after World War I, that opposition to evolution after World War I was, came from politicians rather than from seminaries or theologians because they thought that it was the ideology that was driving the communist as well as the German aggression. And so the prosecutor at the Scopes trial was not a theologian, it was a former secretary of state. Isn't that interesting? Again, just a little deviation of something that I found very personally interesting, I thought you might too. But we often think religion is the problem because we hear politicians saying things like this, climate change is not a science, it's a religion and we know whose fault that is, the problem is Al Gore. He's the one who turned this thing into a religion. And of course, there's proof for anything if you look on the internet. Here's the proof of that. And if you look very carefully, you'll notice that somebody has photoshopped my head onto the choir. Is there something essential about religion in general or Christianity specifically that leads people to reject the reality of a changing climate, what science is telling us. Well, the Pope would say no. The Pope published an encyclical five years ago now that talked all about how climate change is real, how it is caused by humans, how it is serious, and most importantly, in my opinion, how it is incredibly unfair and unjust. He connected the dots clearly between the choices that we make as rich nations and how those are affecting the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. Well, you might say, okay, well, that's the Catholics, but what about the evangelicals? Well, in the United States, many people who call themselves evangelical don't even go to church. In fact, one survey found that half of the people who voted for Trump in the last election who self-identify as evangelical, they don't even go to church. So they're what I would call political evangelicals whose statement of faith is written by their politics first and maybe a distant second by the Bible if they can figure out which way to hold it right side up so they can read it. 
outside the US, there are other evangelicals who I would refer to as theological evangelicals. And there's many of those inside the US as well. The National Association of Evangelicals published a report on climate change four years before the Pope. And it was right on. They had Sir John Houghton write the chapter on the science. So you know it was right. right. And if you go to the World Evangelical Alliance's website today, you will find, and they again represent 600 million evangelicals around the world, you will find a 17-day devotional series on the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which of course number 13 is climate action. We're not quite there yet, but just set your calendar and check back. We're on day nine now, so check back in four days and you'll see a biblical reflection on climate action. So people might say, and this is another of our global weirding episodes, they might say, well, let's just get the Pope to set them straight then, right? Just get the Pope to tell them. It's real. It's us. we got to fix it. Well, that's exactly what the encyclical did, right? But here's the thing. When the American Association of Religion did a survey um, before, just before the encyclical came out, they found that the most concerned people in the U.S. about climate change were Hispanic Catholics. The survey was done in 2014. So you might say, well, of course, Catholics, the Pope, right? Let's fill in the rest of the data. Who do we have at the very bottom? Guess what? White evangelicals and white Catholics are right there together at the bottom. They're the least concerned. And so this is Ashley Landrum. She's one of my colleagues here at Texas Tech. She has extensively studied this. And in a study that she did a couple of years ago, which was a year after the encyclical came out, she found out that in essence, the encyclical did not change people's opinions about climate change as much as it changed people's opinions about the Pope. So she found that Protestants and Catholics who agreed with the Pope about climate change before the encyclical came out were more concerned about climate change afterwards, and they thought more highly of the Pope, but Protestants and Catholics who didn't agree with the Pope before the encyclical came out, it didn't make them change their mind about climate change, it made them change their mind about the Pope. As they would say in Texas, their reaction was, oh, bless his heart which essentially means he means well, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. And of course he does. He has a master's degree in chemistry. And Ram Ramanathan, um, who many of you might know from UC San Diego, he was the head of the scientific team that reviewed the report. But it conflicted with something that was more important to them than their faith. And what is more important to people than their faith these days? Their politics. So in other words, this is what Ashley's study found. She found that if Christians already agreed with the Pope, their opinion of him went up. And if they didn't, it went down. Why is that? Well, John Evans has been looking at this for a long time. He's another sociologist. He said, we know that compared to the not actively religious, conservative Protestants, and I add Catholics too, he only looked at Protestants in his study, they're less likely to believe in the conclusiveness of climate science. But he found in terms of predictors, he found it's not where they go to church that's causing it. He found that it's rooted in age, political conservatism, and the Republican Party. Galen Carey works for the National Association of Evangelicals, and I think he summed this up perfectly. He said, many conservative Christians oppose action to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, but politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. So it isn't a lack of intelligence or education or information or religion. Those are not the real problems. The real problems are this. And here's where we're turning the corner. So far we've been going down and we pretty much hit rock bottom, but now we're starting to go up the other side because the key to successfully addressing a problem is understanding what the problem is in the first place. And up until this point, I feel like, and when I say this point, I mean, you know, the last few years, I feel as if we've been um, deceived by the smoke screen. In fact, let me do this. I feel like we've been deceived by a smoke screen, almost like we're Don Quixote tilting at windmills. We've been deceived by the sciencey sounding objections that are thrown up all the time by politicians, by media pundits, on social media. We've also been deceived by the religious sounding objections that have been thrown up. 
And so we tilt at them like windmills. And believe me, I do my share of tilting too, because I don't want to let disinformation stand in the public sphere. But we tilt at them like windmills, and then we're puzzled when it doesn't change people's minds. It doesn't change their minds because they're not the real problem. They are using them, sometimes consciously and often unconsciously, as a smokescreen for the real problems. And the real problems are this. Go back here. Problem number one is what we just looked at, our identity politics, the fact that we build our identity on politics. Problem number two is something called psychological distance. We feel that climate change is a distant issue that doesn't matter to us here and now. There's other things that are more important. Problem number three is solution aversion. We think the only solutions are punitive and unpleasant. We'd rather not do them, thank you very much. Let me explain each of these in a little bit more detail. You probably understand more or less what I'm talking about, but let me show you some data. Here we go. Problem number one, identity politics. Identity politics basically is the problem that we seem to believe that a thermometer tells us a different answer depending on how we vote. Now you might say, isn't that an exaggeration or hyperbole? Unfortunately, not. Here's some data from Larry Hamilton. Larry Hamilton is a social scientist in New Hampshire. Back in uh, 2017, they had a very warm January. And then he also looked at longer term changes and he did the same survey in both cases and he got the same results. So I'm showing you the one for looking at the last 20 years, but he literally in February asked people if January was warmer and he got the same result. So both weather and climate, we get the same result. Have the past 20 years been warmer in New Hampshire? And over here on the left, you have a figure of New Hampshire's temperature. So the answer clearly according to the data is yes. He asked people by age, not a big difference by age. A little bit more towards the older end, which means, you know, they've been living there long, right? Then he broke out their answers by gender. No big difference, a little bit more for women, but not a lot. Then he broke out their answers by education. A little different, but not a lot. And then he broke out their answers by what? Yes, of course, you guessed it. He broke out their answers by political affiliation. It turns out that literally the numbers that we think a thermometer in our own backyard gives us vary depending on what political affiliation we have. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is psychological distance. And to show you this one, I want to use the maps from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. If you haven't seen these, they're fantastic. They just updated them a couple of weeks ago with new data. They have information on people's answers to 30 different questions-ish, maybe a few more, by county and by congressional district across the whole U.S. They also have some questions for Canada as well. And when you ask people, is global warming happening? you get mostly orange across the whole country. Orange means more than 50% and the darker orange, the more people say yes. If it's blue, it's less than 50%. So you can see a couple blue counties there, but mostly orange. Do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Yes. Do you think global warming will harm future generations? Now you might think this is the same map, but it isn't. It just looks the same, yes. So most people are okay with it's real, it will harm plants and animals, it will harm future generations. How about people in developing countries? It's a little bit lighter here, but it's still mostly orange. How about people in the United States? A lot lighter with some blue. And then here's the kicker. Do you think climate change will harm you? All of a sudden, almost the whole country turns blue, except for counties with the most concerned people about climate change, which you now know are who? Hispanic Catholics, and also often Native Americans as well. Why is that? It's because the number one image people often associate with climate change up until recently has been a polar bear. Or if we see images of people, as the program Climate Outreach talks about, they have a wonderful set of visuals related to climate change. I often go there and I read the text under Climate Outreach's visuals because it explains why a visual is effective. What Climate Visual says is that when we see pictures of people, typically 
Now, again, this is changing. This is starting to change now with the hurricanes and the wildfires and the floods. But typically, the pictures we see are of people who live far away from us who appear to be going about their daily business as opposed to suffering. So this leads to a sense of detachment, of psychological distance. And the last problem we have is one that you've probably run into yourself, and that is the problem of solution aversion. You could be talking to somebody, your neighbor, your father-in-law, your old college roommate, and they'll be saying, I heard those scientists are just making up the data, and I heard it's going to destroy the economy too. I see a snowball. Surely global warming can't be real. But I used to think this thing was real until I found out how much it would cost. Do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I first chaired the Senate Environment Committee? I thought it must be true, literally. And he said this in an interview to Rachel Maddow. You can find it online in 2012. I thought this header was particularly ironic. We are not going to destroy the economy over climate change, he says, while the subheader underneath him says a million Florida homes are at risk due to climate change. So at this point, you might be feeling something like this. This is often my own personal inner monologue. What are we supposed to do? So, okay, I understand that more education on science is not the solution, are not the real problem. I understand that there's identity politics, there's psychological distance, there's um, solution aversion. How are we supposed to address this? We address it by talking about it, but talking about it in a way that specifically counters these three issues. Issue number one is identity politics. To counter it, we have to begin with something that we share rather than something that divides us, bonding. Issue number two is psychological distance. To address it, we have to connect the dots between climate impacts and our lives. So instead of being far away in space or far away in time or far away in relevance, we need to talk about impacts that are here and now and that are relevant to us. And I'm sorry I don't have a slide on this study, but Chris Chu, who is also a researcher here at Texas Tech in Media and Communication, he has studied how when you talk about climate impacts far away on the other side of the world versus when you talk about climate impacts local and close to home, that that actually decreases political polarization on the issue too. So connecting decreases political polarization with the bonding, and then we address solution aversion by talking about positive solutions that people can get on board with rather than solutions that are about destroying the economy, which they frankly aren't. Climate change will, de will destroy the economy if we don't fix it. They've got it totally wrong. So instead of beginning our conversation with a fight or an argument over what we most disagree with the person and the people that we're talking to over, instead of doing that, have that in your head already, get it over with, put it to the side, because that just digs a trench rather than building a bridge. It might end with one or more heads exploding, or it might just end with you being so depressed that you never want to talk about it again, right? I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but I have also felt like this too. I sort of alternate between the two pictures sometimes. So instead of having this negative cycle where climate changes and we get worried and we share more negative, scary information, break the cycle. As researcher Matthew Goldberg found, he said, climate conversations with friends and family create a positive feedback loop where we share how it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. And when I say we, I don't necessarily mean us and light bulbs. I mean every level from personal choices to institutional choices, to cities, to states, to technology, to smart farming, to efficiency and conservation, to uh, international policy. The whole gamut is there. There's no one perfect solution for climate change, but there's a lot of really good hopeful ones. So as a result, people feel empowered and action results because as the neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says, she says, the human brain is built to associate literal forward action. So both physical forward action as well as mental forward action. We are built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So if we're trying to motivate people to move forward but to avoid harm, 
that doesn't work, we actually freeze. Instead, motivating people to move forward with a reward induces hope rather than dread. This is how we break the cycle. So let me close by giving you examples. What do we bond over? How do we connect? And how do we inspire? I'm only giving you a couple of examples on each because this is where I'm leaving it with you. Who you are will determine what you bond with people over. Are you gonna bond over where you live? Are you gonna bond over being a parent? Are you gonna bond over an activity that you enjoy, over being a member of the same club, like a Rotary Club or military experience or a shared faith? Are you gonna bond over the fact that you love cooking together or you like knitting together or you like birding together or you like paddle boarding together or that your kids go to the same preschool? What are you gonna bond with people over? It depends on who you are. So I'm going back to the questions now and get ready because in a couple minutes we'll be taking all of your questions. But I wanna ask you now, give me a word. What do you love that you can bond with people over? And I definitely don't want to see the same word. Oh, I love that. Dancing is the first word. That is awesome. Okay, dancing and karate. Yes, love those. Children, coffee, the outdoors, nature, food. Absolutely. Wildlife, the beach, mm -hmm. tennis. Good. Not sure if that's jogging or mahjong. Oh, mahjong, yes. Don't forget to put the dot in between things. Cooking, yep. Music, yes. Laughing. That's really good. I really like that one. Did you know that there's climate comedy? So next week is climate week, right? That used to be in New York, but now it's all virtual. And there's some climate comedy going on. I don't know if you're familiar with Chuck Nice, but he does climate comedy with Neil deGrasse Tyson, of all people. And then Max Boykoff from the University of Colorado, he does comedy with this program called Under the Greenhouse, where you actually get students involved in comedy, um, laughing about climate change. And then over in the UK, there's a scientist called Maddie Wynn, and he has some hilarious YouTube videos about, he actually makes jokes about RCP scenarios and about <laughs> global climate models. So if you're interested in comedy, check out Max Boykoff, Maddie Wynn, and Chuck Nice. But the point is, is look how diverse this is. I mean, we have a few words that are kind of sticking out like dark chocolate, I'm with you there, and music and outdoors and dancing and bread eating, also with you on all of those. But we are as diverse as everybody else, and that's where we can connect to people over. So then once we've connected, once we've bonded, I should say, then we connect. We talk about what's happening where we live. We talk about how um, our oceans are being affected, how our homes are being affected, how our kids are being affected, how the quality of our chocolate and our coffee and our beer and our wine and our food are being affected. We, we, if we knit, we pull out the knitting stripes, uh, the warming stripes pattern that Ed Hawkins designed, and we knit with our knitting club to show the warming stripes of where we, we live. In our book club, we pick up a book that talks about what's happening to our world. It could be fiction or it could be nonfiction. Explain why it matters where we live and increasingly, attribution is helping us to put numbers even on the fact that wildfire is burning more than double the area it used to due to climate change. Or um, it's estimated up to two thirds of the economic impacts during Hurricane Harvey were due to the fact that the hurricane was supersized by a changing climate. We know people who are being affected and we can start to tell personal stories also and that's part of connecting. But then the last part is frankly the hardest part for me as a scientist to do because I don't do solutions. Do you do solutions? Probably most of you don't either. But we have to do the work to at least know a couple of good solutions and know where people can go to find out more information about solutions because we have to tackle solution aversion by showing that fixing climate change will leave us with a world that's better than the one we have today, not worse. It is absolutely essential to do this because otherwise we're telling people about a problem, but we're not telling them how we can fix it. So what I love to do is I love to share things that are already happening to prove to them that we're not just trying to roll a giant boulder uphill. The boulder's already up atop a hill. It's starting to roll downhill slowly. It needs more hands to get it going faster. But you know what? Apple's hands are already on it. Walmart's hands are already on it. The hands of many faith communities are already on it, believe it or not. You probably do believe it after this talk, right? We've got examples like a coal mining museum going solar. We've got airlines flying biofuel flights. It's still good to reduce our flying for sure. I do as much virtually as I can. 
We know that kids are winning the Intel Science Fair for designing algae biofuel. We know that clean energy is revolutionizing the lives of people who live around the world. You're probably familiar with Project Drawdown. I love how so many of their solutions have nothing to do with energy. Solutions like biochar, pyrolyzing agricultural waste at a high temperature and plowing it back into the ground where it's like miracle grow on steroids. Clean cook stoves that also reduce indoor air pollution and save lives, primarily women and children. Educating women and girls is one of their solutions and reducing food waste. There's smart agriculture, there's ecosystem management, reforestation, all kinds of amazing solutions. If you don't know what to talk about, just go to Drawdown, read a few articles, pick a few, and bring them up in conversation. Does talking about it make a difference? I can't end without actually showing you the peer-reviewed literature on this, right? Because you might be saying, sure, I know that you might say talking matters, but does it really? Well, apparently it does. As I mentioned, it actually leads us to greater acceptance because People know more. The more they know, the more concerned they are when we connect it to their lives personally. It helps to know that scientists agree. And it creates that true positive feedback loop where climate changes, we get worried. We share information about why it matters and what we can do to fix it. People feel empowered and action results. This study came out last year and I loved it because it talked about kids. It turns out that educating middle school children actually changes their parents' opinions. Parents of kids who learn more about climate change express higher levels of concern. Effects were strongest among male parents and conservative parents, and daughters were particularly effective at changing their dad's minds. How cool is that? Bob Inglis, who you may know, is a Republican uh, two-term congressman from South Carolina. His mind was changed by his son who learned about this in university. And I have heard so many other people who said that their kids were the ones who changed their mind. And they sometimes even cited the professor or the teacher who taught their child who then taught them. Does talking matter? Or sorry, does talking work? It doesn't work on absolutely everyone because as the six Americas of global warming shows from the Yale Program on Climate Communication, 10% of us are dismissive. Dismissive people are the loudest voices on social media. They are the ones who send the insults on Twitter every single day. My personal definition of a dismissive person is somebody who, if an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real and foot high letters of flame appeared before them, they would never change their minds. But the good news is, is that 90% of us are not dismissive. And so for the 90% of us talking about why it matters and what we can do to fix it really does change minds. And this is important because, remember I showed you this map about the people who don't think that global warming harms them personally? It's important because these are not the bluest maps. There's two maps that are bluer. Do you ever talk about it? No, not unless you live apparently in Seattle or San Francisco. Do you ever hear about it in the media? No. So the most important thing we can do is turn this around because if you never talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever act? So how do we talk about science in a fact-free world? We begin with what we have in common, not what divides us. We connect the dots to how this affects what we already care about today and we find ways that we can work together, not apart, to act. And that's why when they told me I could do a TED Talk, I picked this topic. The most important thing you can do to fight climate change is talk about it. And what this talk was, was this talk was the science behind the TED Talk. This talk was the talk about why I did this, how I did it, what data and research informed what I did, and then if you wanna watch the final product, of course, you can do so here. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Catherine, that was wonderful. So, oh, I'm supposed to start my video? Hold yes. On. So people now can pose questions. And the way you do it is you continue. You go to polyv.com slash Catherine. You type in your whole question. You don't need any weird dots or dashes or anything like that. Type in your whole question. And here's the fun thing. 
you can upvote other people's questions. So if we get more questions than we can answer, you just go and you upvote the one that you really want us to answer, and that way we can see which ones the most people are interested in. Oh, I, yes. saw, I saw this work at AGU and it was lots of fun. Okay. I'm going to take that off the screen now, um, but everybody can see the questions themselves if you go to polyv.com slash Catherine, and Mo, you and I can look at them ourselves there too. Okay, so do you want me to read it or do you want to read it, Catherine? Oh, no, no, you, you go ahead, and you can, you can go for the first one or you can read the, you know, whatever order you want. We've already got three questions and there's more coming in as we speak. Wait, oh, I see what they are. Uh, is there a theory for how individual conversations can scale up to national global change? That's a good question. Um, there are people who are working on exactly that. I briefly mentioned the organization Climate Outreach, and they go and they do conversational groups with people where they specifically employ this type of approach. And I know there's other organizations like Climate Generations in Minnesota. I know of organizations that are working with kids and young people to take this approach of having conversations. I know of faith-based groups that have conversation guides and discussion groups to get people started talking about this. So I've seen this model, not implemented the whole national scale um, regardless, but I've seen it being implemented in specific communities. And if you know the community that you would like to start implementing this in, Climate Outreach has a lot of great resources that you can use. They have a nice little manual called Talking Climate that you can use to start talking about this. So, so the, by far the biggest question here is how do, I'm learning how to read this myself, how do we bond with people who are far from us, both politically and physically? Oh, well, that's such a good question because now most of our bonding is with people who are far away physically. Yeah. Um, many of us have attended, all, probably all of us, have, almost all of us have attended, you know, family celebrations or birthday parties on Zoom. Some people have attended weddings on Zoom. Some people have attended funerals on Zoom. I've done that myself. We're realizing that we have to turn to technology to connect now in ways that we didn't do a year ago. And although it is the curse of our times today, in another way, it might actually be an opportunity for us to connect more face-to-face -face with people in a way that we didn't used to. I've actually found myself talking to people more with the camera on than I used to. And it's better to talk to people that way because when we're looking at each other as humans, we're better able to connect than when we're, um, when we're just a voice and we're much better able to connect than when we're typing on social media. When we're typing on social media, it is very easy to view the other person as not really human, not really part of our tribe. But the other part of the question is how do we connect with people who are very far from us politically? The answer to that is, we have to find something that we have in common. And if we don't know what that is, we can keep you know, getting to know the person or getting to know the people. But if we feel like we know them pretty well, and we've known them for a long time, and we really honestly can't find a single thing to connect on, then we might not be the person to have the conversation with them. And that's okay. We don't have to ha be the right person to have a conversation with everyone. Let me give you two examples, um, both examples of a fellow scientist. So um, a couple of different times giving talks at a university, both in Canada and the US, I've had a fellow scientist come up to me afterwards and say, I've been really inspired by how you reach out to local churches. And so I've been trying to do the same thing, but I haven't been able to get my foot in the door. Do you have any suggestion on how to, you know, initiate a connection with, with a local church or congregation? So each time I said, well, the best place to start is with the one that you have the most in common with. So if you're Jewish, go to the synagogue. If you're Protestant, go to, you know, a mainline Protestant church. If you're evangelical, go to evangelical church, you know, so on and so forth. So I said, you know, what, what denomination or tradition do you belong to? And in each case, the scientist said, oh, I'm an atheist. So I said, stop. Just stop. You are not the right person to reach out because you're trying to connect over a value that you don't genuinely share. So instead, I said, the question I asked you all, what do you love? What are you passionate about? What are your values? What are you engaged in? What are your activities? And in most cases, when we scientists are asked that, we say, well, science. I was like, yeah, I know, but what else? So um, I, had to take, I had to take him through you know, a couple of different things. So I said, you know, do you hike? Do you ski? Are you part of the Rotary Club? Are you part of a community club? No, no, no. So we went through about 10 or 12 things. And finally he said, well, I dive. And I was like, well, 
there you go. And he said, well, yeah, actually I have some records for some very deep dives and I dive quite a bit. And this is something I love doing. I was like, well, how about you reach out to Patty certification programs? How about you reach out to diving organizations and clubs and talk to them because I'm not a diver. So I can't reach out to them, but you can. Um, so in that case, he was able to identify a group that he could reach out to very effectively. Now, let me give you the second example. The second example comes from John Cook. John is a social scientist at George Mason University, originally from Australia. Many of you know him as the founder of um, Skeptical Science. He also has a great new book called Cranky Uncle, accompanied by YouTube videos that he drew himself. So check out the Cranky Uncle videos. John has a dad. And the reason why John does all of this is because of his dad. Every time he'd go home for dinner, his dad would be like, well, John, there's more polar bears now than there ever have been. How do you account for that if you say the Arctic is melting? So John goes back to school, gets a PhD in cognitive psychology, becomes the world's foremost expert on debunking misinformation about climate change. And do you think it changed his dad's mind? It no. didn't. <laughs> it did not because he was not the right person to change his dad's mind. But you know what? His dad's mind did eventually change. You know how it changed? His dad's identity was that of a fiscal conservative. Shrewd. Knows how to pinch his pennies. There was a rebate on solar panels in his neighborhood. He crunched the numbers. He figured out how much money he would save and how foolish the government was for offering this rebate to him. <laughs> so he put the solar panels on his roof, started to save all kinds of money, started to email John every month with how much money he had saved. And then about two years after he installed his solar panels, they were sitting together at a table. And John told me recently, he said, his dad said to him something along the lines of, well, of course, global warming is real. And I've always thought so. <laughs> and John said he almost fell off his chair. <laughs> and then his dad's like, but did I tell you how much I saved on my solar panels? <laughs> so that was what changed his dad's mind. It wasn't him. So we have to make sure that we're not digging a dry well, we're not arguing with a dismissive, the 10%, and we're, we, we're talking to somebody that we really do and really are able to bond and connect with. I know that was kind of a long answer, but given that there was 26 people who voted for that, I guess you got 26 answers in one there. That's good. Here's one I think is good. For which climate organizations do you recommend a young scientist volunteer? Oh, well, there are so many climate organizations that I recommend you look for one that you connect with. You look for one that really embodies your values, that embodies your priorities. And even if they don't um, reach out to you, there's no harm in reaching out to them. In fact, the, very first, the way that I personally connected to all of the um, faith-based organizations that are doing outreach on climate change was I emailed one of them out of the blue. I just cold emailed them. And I just said, hey, just want to let you know, I'm a climate scientist. I've been getting your emails and your newsletters for a couple of years now. I don't know if you could ever use somebody like me or if you've been you know, ever interested in anything I could help you with, but if you are, let me know. And the rest, as they say, is history. So look for some, somebody or something that shares your interests. And there are so many of them. And just say, hey, guess what? I'm a big fan of what you do. I love what you do. I'm a climate scientist. Here's what I do. If you ever need anything, let me know. Here's another one of the high, high ones. How do we address racism and climate change together? Well, the single best description, in my opinion, of climate change is the one that the US military uses, and that is a threat multiplier. So in other words, climate change is not creating new problems we've never seen before. It's taking the problems we already have and it's making them worse. It takes poverty and hunger it takes disease and lack of access to clean water. It takes political instability and refugee crises. It takes air pollution and water pollution and biodiversity loss and ecosystem fragmentation and habitat loss. It takes all of those things and it makes them worse. And it also takes issues of uh, racial injustice. It takes issues of uh, gender-based injustice. It takes all kinds of issues like that. And it makes them worse. And the people who disproportionately suffer from climate change are people of color, um, indigenous peoples, women and children, as opposed to men, people who are poor, as opposed to people who are rich, even right here in the US, as well as on the other side of the world, people who are handicapped, as opposed to people who are fully abled. Those who are already suffering today are the people who are already affected by climate change most today. And so 
often people say, well, you know, I worry about this, so I don't have time to think about climate change. And my answer is the only reason we care about climate change is because of all of these other things. And so how do we address racism and climate change? We have to address climate change because it's making racism worse, not better. And it's making it um, the impacts that people are experiencing because of something as superficial as the color of their skin even worse than they are today. It all goes together. And so I'm really glad that organizations like the NCAAP have a huge section on um, environmental justice. I actually just restructured my graduate course so that the first unit goes way in depth on issues of climate justice, featuring videos and talks and essays that are written by people like um, Bob Bullard, who is often referred to as the father of environmental justice. He's from Houston and he talks about how um, uh, dumps and hazardous waste disposal is often put in poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Um, indigenous voices, voices of people from other countries talking about how they're impacted by climate change. It all goes together. We can't fix climate change without the others and we can't fix the others without climate change. But by fixing climate change, I think we're moving in the right direction of starting to address those problems as well. So thank you for asking that question. That's a really important one. Do you, do you have the bandwidth for one more? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, oh, I lost it now. This list is getting, going up and down. Where's the one about Naomi Oreskes? Oh, sorry. Oh, I see that one. What's your view on how to deal with and overcome like the merchants of doubt stuff, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness. So, um, back in, when was this? Back oh. in 20, I think it was 2011, um, the last presidential election um, when Obama was elected. Um, back then, I had been invited the previous year to give a talk at an organization called Republicans for Environmental Protection. And they now, they still exist. They're called Conserve America now. And as a result of speaking there, I was asked to write the first chapter in a new book that was being edited by um, Newt Gingrich and it was being put out by Johns Hopkins Press. So, you know, it's been put out by an academic press. They asked me to write the first chapter explaining that climate change is real and we have to fix it. Um, so I wrote the chapter, I handed it in. They didn't try to, you know, edit it or change the contents at all. But then I never really heard back. And I went to the Johns Hopkins Press website. They still had the book listed, but the publication data changed. And then I, the editor wasn't responding to me. And I was like, what's going on with this chapter? Why isn't it being published? And then the primary started. It turned out Newt Gingrich was running as a candidate for the Republican Party. And then somebody found out that I had written a chapter for this book and he was asked at a town hall meeting, why is a climate scientist writing a chapter for your book? And he said, oh, I didn't know she was and we'll get rid of that chapter right away. So there was just this avalanche of hate, of emails, of um, and protest to my university that they had a climate scientist at the university. Um, Freedom of Information Act requests from these organizations that Naomi talks about in Merchants of Doubt, um, claiming, now the Freedom of Informa Information Act requests or the FOIAs, they can just say, we would like your emails that have these words in them. They didn't say that. They said, we know that you have committed a crime. We know that you have used university resources inappropriately. We will look for the evidence, we will find that evidence, and we will prosecute you for it, for writing a chapter in an academic book, which as it turned out, I was writing it after I was on, when I was on maternity leave. <laughs> so I was writing it at home with my own laptop, not using university resources at all, anyways. So that was my introduction into the fact that there is this organization. And at the same time I was reading Climate Cover-Up by Jim Hogan, and he's a PR expert who doesn't talk about the money. He talks about all the very sophisticated PR techniques that they're using. And at the end of reading that book, I felt like a girl guide trying to fight the Marines or special ops. I thought, we are so naive. What was I thinking that just, you know, communicating facts would make a difference? What on earth was I doing? I was wasting my time completely. These people are smart. They're sophisticated. They have the richest companies in the world behind them, as Merchants of Doubt shows. Why are we even bothering to do this? And so for about three or four weeks, I actually seriously considered quitting. But I didn't. And here's what I decided to do instead. 
I decided to not be naive anymore. I decided to find out about this. I decided to follow Naomi's work and her Exxon new campaign and program that she's doing now. I decided to educate myself on the social science. I decided to learn about messaging and about framing and about all those PR and communication techniques that they've been using that we weren't using. I decided to learn about all those and I decided to tell you all about those too so that rather than us, you know, fighting with sticks and swords, you know, and, and on horseback as the Nazi tanks roll over Poland, which is what was happening at that time. Instead, we understand the tools that are being used and we use those tools for good rather than for evil. But we have to recognize we are fighting an uphill battle because as you probably know, um, 90 corporations are responsible for two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. That was worked by Richard Heed, Heed with an E on the end. And many of those same corporations are on the list of the richest companies in the world too. So we are fighting an uphill battle. And the only thing I can say, and this is probably an appropriate way to end, the only thing I can say is that we have truth on our side. Wow, Catherine, thank you. That's really powerful. And I, I've always been in awe of your ability to just maintain your equilibrium and sense of humor and optimism in the face of the attacks that you do uh, are subjected to especially on social media. It's psychological warfare. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Um, I, it's wonderful that you brought up Robert Bullard. He spoke in one of our student graduate student seminars on Tuesday. Oh, um, So that was wonderful. And, mm -hmm. you know, I hope that uh, people will feel free to email you and, and mm -hmm. continue this conversation online. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your perspective on this. It's been wonderful. Thank you for having me. This has been fantastic. Please do reach out on social media, on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or even Instagram. Although on Instagram, I mostly post the books I'm reading and the knitting I'm doing. Um, and I would love to answer a couple more of these questions on Facebook, or I should say on Twitter, because I'm seeing a few more questions I can answer very briefly. So look on Twitter and you'll get a few more answers afterwards. That's awesome. Thanks so much. We can bond over knitting. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming and we hope you had a wonderful hour here with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.